Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. If you are looking for a fork in time, the Alternate History Podcast, we're so glad that you've successfully found us. This is Don today sitting in the host chair, excited about today's episode. As we mentioned over about the one and a half year course of the podcast, one of the cool things that's happened is we've been able to interact with our listening community, and some of our listeners have actually become our show contributors. And this is something that we hope to continue to evolve and grow over the over the life of the podcast. And so today here on a fork in time, we're going to be in, in joined by one of our now most frequent contributors, that's Chris Capello. Uh, Chris is going to be joining us to uh, talk about an episode suggestion that he made to us, and we hope that you stay with us after the break uh, when Chris joins us and we start talking about a particular historical what-if of the early 20th century. Hope we find you back soon. Hi, it's Don. And Alexis, I'm here too. Taking a quick break from the podcast, really to just reach out and something we normally do, it's sort of at the end of a lot of episodes. What do we normally encourage people to do at the end of our episodes, Lex? Give us suggestions. Give us suggestions and do other things for us to interact with us. And the best place to do that is it's our little corner, quaint little corner, not overly decorated and not overly ornate, but still corner of the internet. And where will folks find that at? It's a fork in time podcast.com. Like we say, the A is important. The podcast is important to get to the right place. Yeah. And so among the things that you can find at a fork in time.com uh, podcast, see, it is important, <laughs> is that you can find links to our previous shows. Uh, you can find uh, but a number of different ways to give us feedback. So we have comment, comment forms and we read and we digest those and we've made changes to the show. But there's also topic suggestions there. And so one of the things that we want to encourage our listeners to do is what, Lex? Is to give us those suggestions. Go to that website. Yeah, here's the deal. I know because I get to see the statistics, we've talked often about the statistics, that a lot of the episodes that we do that are focused on a particular part of the world, I won't say which, but Alexis knows which one it is, uh, because it, w- w- those get good li- those get good listenership. I think a lot of our listeners like us to go there, but we also understand that sometimes we go to, we can go to the same places or the same time frames too often. Yep. And one of the ways that we know to diversify the content of the show is to diversify the content outside of my head and Alexis's head, and then some of the contributors that have been on with some frequency and some regularity that you've gotten to know. So we need your help. Uh, if there's a part of history that you think is being drastically overlooked that has all types of interesting what-if twists, uh, don't leave it to us to find that. What do you need to do, Lex? You need to go submit it in the website. <laughs> yeah, please do. In, in detail there, I normally interact with folks once they've submitted suggestions. In fact, that's how a number of the folks who have joined the podcast have come on the podcast, because not only did they have good ideas, but they were ready to articulate those ideas, and we welcome that. So we just wanted to take a brief moment here to encourage you to check out www.aforkintimepodcast.com and uh, find the resources that are there. During this time when we are still endeavoring through the global pandemic, we still have our COVID check-in. We still want to hear from you there and just the other ways that we invite you to interact as well. Even if you already checked in with us, check in again. It's been months. Yeah, we would appreciate that. So again, uh, what we're pitching here is we're pitching ourselves but we're mainly pitching the website. So one last time for the listeners, Lex, where is that going to be? A fork in time podcast.com. Check it out. Welcome back to a fork in time, the alternate history podcast. As I mentioned before the break, we're joined today by, I think the last time that Chris was on the show, we dubbed him officially the show agitator. And I think he liked that. So I'm happy to say that show agitator, Chris Capolo is back with us today. Chris, good to have you with us again. Good. Great to be back. Good to have you back. I know we were talking off podcast here. You just finished a fairly long drive across a good portion of the country today. So we're going to jump right into the topic before you you nod off from uh, your your late road sleepiness here. But uh, you had brought a couple of different topics, I guess, a couple of months ago, and we talked about coming around to them as we get there. And I'm really intrigued by the topic that we're going to cover today. And I didn't tease it at all uh, before the break, other than saying that you were going to be joining us. So, Chris, uh, you've 
agreed to do two things here today, which is to engage in our what if exercise. Before we do that, you're going to give us a valuable what did exercise to set this up, because I think we're on one of the more, I think the term I used earlier was more and more the side, one of the side streets of history, but it's important because it connects to a couple of main thoroughfares, which is why it's worth looking at. So uh, Chris, having said that, and uh, now I'm going to shut up <laughs> and let you do what I know you can do well, which is sort of set us up and then we can lead off into the what if. Okay. So uh, the topic for today, uh, today's podcast is going to be the most important battle that you've never heard of. Um, and trying to re realizing that this is a little off the beaten path. Um, I you know was thinking about how to set it up and I, 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 the point I want to begin with is almost a point coming back to kind of how I got started on this podcast was late 19th century Europe um, and kind of the two views of what's going on, where Europe is going, where the world is going. And the first being a rosier picture, kind of the view of, I don't quite want to say the 1%, but of, you know, European leaders that now, you know, our nations have been created, both France or uh, both Germany and Italy exist, our empires are out there, we're all industrializing and we're competing, but we're integrating with each other. Uh, this is often referred to as the first era of globalization. You would have cotton farmed in the United, in the Southern United States, made into cloth in Birmingham and dyed with chemicals from Cologne, Germany you really had international trade. And one of the arguments, one of the ideas of geopolitical thinkers of this time is that this integration has reached such a level that we can't have any more wars because it doesn't make sense to, because we trade with each other. We make too much money from each other to actually throw that all away. Um, let me be very clear. This is, you know, 1910 Europe. We all know what's coming. <laughs> you're, you're, you're saying that history has borne out that that concept, at least for the short term, was not true. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and uh, yeah, the other the other kind of thought current going around then is popular in many radical circles, which is basically that all of this exploitation of capital exploiting labor, of core countries, metropolitan countries exploiting colonies, um, is just conflict, conflict, conflict building up. Almost that uh, European capitalism is a fire and it needs oxygen. It needs something to fuel itself. And what's going to happen is it's going to keep fueling itself by consuming more markets and reaching more and more until it's reached the point that it can't and it's going to burn itself out and collapse. So that's very, that's a, that, that I think is a really important point to get into the importance of what we're talking about today. Just that there were two broad schools of thought that shared that shared a common point where things were, how things appeared to be coming, but they looked at them from two very distinct different points of view. Right, right. And um, so then some archduke went and got himself shot. <laughs> um, and, you know, we all have heard the wonderful stories about everyone swearing that they'll be home by Christmas. Um, the interesting thing I've heard is there uh, the British uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer also believed that the war would be over by Christmas, not because their victorious armies would already be marching through Berlin, but because the war would bankrupt the British Empire. Wow. It has, to be, right. it has to be over by Christmas because that's the only budget we've got. Right, because then the credit bill comes due. Right. We only got six months, no APR. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And the, the reason that's important, you know, so I talk about that to start thinking about the battle we're talking about is the Battle of Warsaw in 1920. So we're all a little, you know, whenever we hear World War I, we think Western Front trenches, all of that. Um, there was another thing. You don't have a Western Front without an Eastern Front. Right. And out there, it worked very differently. Um, one of the things about the Western Front is, it's interesting, um, Don mentioned that I drove, I had a long drive today. Um, I probably covered at least the entire Western Front, right. come to think of it. You, you drove for several hundred miles. In fact, we looked it yes. up because we were curious how yes. far it was. Yeah, About 400. I probably covered the entire Western Front. It would take a week to cover the Eastern Front. It right. goes from the Baltic all the way down to the Black Sea. And, and the reason I'm talking about that and the reason that's important is just the sheer scale, the sheer scope of where all of this is happening. The war is very different. It, all of the fighting there, both in World War I and what we're about to talk about soon, I promise soon, <laughs> is cyclical it, it it's you're you're out there on almost an island and there's no forest there's no coast there's no rivers that you can pin your flank to i'm reminded it's a, it's a lot like if you've ever read accounts of the north african theater in world war ii where it begins with the italians sweeping into egypt and the british drive them back out and rommel comes back and then they push Rommel back, and then he comes back to El Amain, and, and it just seems like you have these sweeps without anybody being hurt that much, because they right. keep being able to sweep back as soon as they get a little bit of a chance to regroup, and well, here we go all over again. There's a different, um, uh, this is the thought that just popped into my head, but war has a different density. On, on, yes. on the two different fronts and in ways that the space is part of that, but then just how much, how many men you have and how sparse that makes that or how sweeping the moves are simply because you're dealing with a much larger space. There's room to maneuver maneuvers. Yes. Not that maneuver is not important in all warfare, but again, it's just the density of the, of the conflict is just different. Yes. Yes. So um, world war one in the East, long story short, Russia loses. Um, they can't keep up. They, you know, started strong, but their their society could not sustain it. And in November of 1917, they had a revolution. In March 1918, they signed what was called the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. What that did is it basically gave Germany the most productive parts of Russia. Most of their coal, their good farmland, it, it was very punitive. And uh, basically, if you follow the history of it, Germany took these troops, rushed them as quickly as they could all the way across Europe to try and break France before the Americans got a chance to get into it. That didn't work. Um the Americans got there in the nick of time, and basically, <sighs> Germany had shot their try, um, and World War I ended. Uh, the reason that's important is now you had this huge swath of territory, what is today all of the Baltics, all of Belarus, all of Ukraine, that had been Germany and is now what we don't really know because the last anybody checked russia had given it to germany now the western allies are saying germany your border is you know antebellum much, much, yeah <laughs> no not even antebellum, antebellum minus <laughs> yes antebellum minus we're gonna go ahead and create this thing called poland and we don't quite know what that means where that is and so, you know, in, in, well, the next time Germany decides to get cute out in Eastern Europe, um, there's a thing, the Red Army that 
helps them along, helps them move out even, you know, provides all of the uh, the moving pads, all of the furniture they need to, to move back out. This time, they just run. They just go back to Germany, and there's a huge power vacuum there. Uh, Russia, Soviet Union is in the middle of a civil war because, uh, let's just say, certain parties within Russia demanded a recount. Uh, said that the Bolsheviks had not won and took to the streets to try and fight them. So right around when things start getting interesting, the Soviets have beaten most of what were called the White Armies. This is the summer of 1919. You know, Right now we are recording in November, and it, it's interesting now to think about it. The Russians had beat the Whites in the spring and summer of 1919, that was right after the end of the war. Um, we just finished Veterans Day, and that's the end of World War One. Next campaign season, the Soviets are pretty successful against the Reds, or sorry, against the Whites. Um, I did mention there was a country created out of thin air that had hadn't existed for 150 years called Poland, and Poland starts trying to fill this vacuum because the reason there wasn't a Poland for a long time is they had gotten squeezed out between what was to become Germany, what was Russia and Austria, and they just kept getting chunks taken out of them. So they decide this is a great opportunity. Let's go ahead and take as much as we can. Um, and this leads to the beginning of the Russo-Polish War of 1920. And that, that's what this is focusing on. Um, so, yeah, Don, I've been talking for a bit. I kind of am awful. I, I kind of feel a little like Wile E. Coyote. I'm standing in the air and, and there's no more cliff. Um, yeah. <laughs> but you're holding up a sign, right? Yes, to, uh, yes. <laughs> to, borrow the, to borrow the Coyote Roadrunner motif. Well, this is probably a good place then for us to break. As you set up the, what, we, what we're arriving at and what's going to be our fork, which is actually going to be here at uh, the, the Battle of Warsaw. Yes. And, and picking up on a different outcome from there and how that moves forward. So we invite you to stick with us as Chris has gotten us up to an understanding of sort of the two big thoughts uh, that have been existing there over the, over the couple of decades that are leading up to this. And we're right after World War I. When we come back, we'll pick up with the fort proper, which is in, I guess that's in August of 1920. So we're moving into that period in 1920. We're going to talk about, again, the most important battle that you've never heard of, which is the Battle of Warsaw. We hope you stick with us after the break. We'll be right back. Taking a quick break from the podcast. Here's Don. And Alexis. And we're going to talk to you once again about one of our favorite things. You've heard us talk about this before. It happens to be the way that Alexis and I do most of our reading, and we are both avid readers, mm -hmm. but it's more effective to say these days I'm an avid listener, because I don't read as much as I used to anymore. I don't like the strain on my eyes, and I don't like the uh, the strange positions you have to cock your body in to turn pages of books, even digital books, and so I do most of my reading by being a story time adult and being read too, mm -hmm. and I use Audible. So what's been your experience with Audible, Lex? I love Audible, and I love Audible because it is unabridged versions of books. I think that's an excellent point. Sometimes, particularly in the old days of books on tape, yeah, that dated me right there, even books on CDs, to do an unabridged version of particularly nonfiction, but fiction uh, was pretty bold. You'd have to have a lot of tapes or a lot of CDs. So now that things are in a uh, digital format, of course they have been for over a decade, One of the I agree with you, one of the great things I love about Audible is these are not uh, excerpts from books, these are not abridged versions of books, these are unabridged versions of the source material. So it's limited to just a few types of topics, just a few types of genres, right Lex? Does that be no? Oh, the answer is no. So obviously we deal with alternate history, so you can find real history. Yes, which I've done before. Right. You can find alternate history. So, you know, Philip Dick, uh, Philip K. Dick, uh, Harry Toadlove, mm -hmm. some of the others that we've often mentioned on the podcast, many of their books can be found in audible format. But it's not just books. No. What else is there? Podcast, theatrical productions, tons of different mediums. 
on Audible. Yeah, in addition to that, there are daily reads of things like the Wall Street Journal, yep. periodicals. So it's an excellent place, just whatever you would like to do and consume that in an audio format, Audible is the place to do it. So one of the things we've arranged uh, for our Fork and Time listeners is uh, we've arranged for you to have a free trial. Try it before you buy it. So how does that work, Lex? So if you go to the link in our show notes, or if you want to go directly to it, you want to go to audibletrial.com slash a fork in time. That's where you want to go. And doing that will benefit us, but also you'll be able to get a free month of Audible and an audio download as well. Right. And so the other neat thing about that is because Audible is affiliated with Amazon, is if you happen to be a Prime member taking advantage of the one month free offer uh, that we provide, and again we get the credit for that. You could you by the way you could get that offer other ways, but we'd like for you to do that through us. Doesn't cost you any more to do that, so you can help us while you're helping yourself. But you actually get two credits to use during that first month. And two credits to use, period, if you get onto a subscription plan. And a credit normally is equivalent to a book or to an audio production. So, again, a fully unabridged book uh, is covered by one credit. Exactly. Uh, but you're limited to the types of devices you can listen on, right? Uh, no. So you what can... What are phones, some examples? Phones, iPhone, Android, uh, iPads, just your regular laptop or desktop computer. I mean... Yeah, you're not limited in any way with Audible. Yeah, and although I don't do it personally, but I know I know people who do this, if you have Amazon's smart speaker configuration, you can actually even listen to um, um, Audible programs there. It will remember where you are, so you can listen at home through the smart speaker, get into your car, listen through your smartphone that's connected. You can, you can really just follow along and make it a seamless experience wherever you go. Yep. So we invite you to help the show, help yourself, and go check out Audible. Welcome back to A Fork in Time. Uh, again, we're joined today by uh, uh, show contributor, uh, show agitator, Chris Capola. I always enjoy having Chris on the show. Uh, Chris is uh, one of the folks that we found as a result of starting the podcast. And it's, it's good to have the folks that are out there, again, we've talked about so often that are part of our community that we're building. And I enjoy talking with Chris off podcast and certainly enjoy having him on the program. So thanks again, Chris, for joining. As we were leading up to the break, we were talking about setting things up here for what our fork is going to be. And the fork, again, focusing this down, our fork is going to be on a different outcome for the Battle of uh, Warsaw in 1920. You sort of brought us up to the, to the, to the, the launching off point of that fork. And so we'll pick it up from here talking about very briefly what did happen in the real timeline, but then of course breaking over into the fork. So in the real world, uh, Polish forces in this newly created place you were just talking about before the break called Poland, that's been struggling to be and now is uh, are fighting against the Soviet army. And what happens in the real timeline there in Warsaw? So in the real timeline, uh, in May of 1920, the Polish realized that the Soviets are about done with their civil war, and we kind of think we are next on the menu. Um, and throughout history, when you're a smaller country with a smaller military that may not be able to go toe-to-toe, um, I'm thinking about the Middle East in June 1967, or actually something uh, Don and I were talking about off podcast. Uh, this is one of the best explanations for what the Japanese do at the beginning of the Pacific War. If you know you're next, you hit them now and hit them hard and hope to hit them hard enough to knock them out. And that's exactly what the Polish did. They actually launched a surprise attack on the Soviet Union in May of 1920 and swept through Ukraine and actually took Kiev. Um, what happened after that is the Russian forces that were already planning to invade Poland got around to it. Um, looking at the geography here, it, it, it's a, easy to kind of think about, we're all pretty familiar with Barbarossa where when Germany invades, they send the columns, one towards Kiev and one towards Moscow. The reason they do this is there's a giant swamp in between them. And it's kind of hard for those two to talk to each other. Uh, in this case, 
the Polish have attacked towards Kiev and have taken Kiev on the southern kind of nice flat plain. The Soviets are coming down the northern flat plain, kind of the Moscow, Smolensk, Minsk line, aiming right at Poland. And they attack, and the Poles in the Ukraine start running because they need to get back because if they don't get back to Poland quickly, the Soviets are going to beat them there. Um, so they run back. Um, the northern Soviet armies keep advancing, go into today what is Poland, and actually get almost to the German border. They're coming in kind of along the Baltic, if you can picture it, close to East Prussia, and they're about to come around behind the back of Warsaw, cut it off, take the capital, war's over, red Poland, uh, you know, 25 years early. Um, what happens in our timeline is a man by the name of Joseph Pilsudski, who's the general, the military leader of Poland at this point, realizes they haven't actually kept in touch with the Soviets coming out of Ukraine. Um, and if we were to cut between them, we can encircle basically this entire Russian army, and then they'll start running. They'll get scared, and we might even be able to win the war. In our timeline, this is referred to as the miracle on the Vistula, because the Polish army, which had not existed in the had not existed a year before, launches this right hook and completely surprises the Soviets, sends them fleeing back all the way out of um, out of Poland. And if you look at a map of Poland, basically pre-1939, that border is pretty far east and this is why, because they won that war and they got to kind of draw that line where they wanted. Right. So, as we always ask, so uh, to fully explain to our listeners, Chris, <laughs> that's what happened in the real timeline. So yes. what, what is unique or different about our fork here? Our fork here is this. Um, the Soviets weren't stupid people. They had troops in the Ukraine, and they had ordered those troops to keep up and to push into Poland to basically help protect the northern force. Um, it just so happens that the political commissar, the person in charge of the southern flank, was... Wait for it. Wait for it. <laughs> yes. Yosef Vissarionovich Dugashvili. Um, and yeah, okay, that was Stalin. That was yeah. that was Stalin's birth name. I I I, I dragged it out as long <laughs> as I could. Stalin. It's Stalin here. Um, I'm gonna quit Stalin and tell you it was Stalin. Stalin. Boom. Yes. Um, I'll you see know, if in, post, in post production. I'll see if I can put in the uh, uh, the, uh, the the drum hit there for you. I feel like some trumpets <laughs> along his name. That would that would be appropriate. Um. Okay. So, yes, it, you know, he, what he basically did is the old trick of here's a radio message. That's what you think that says. They need to resend it. That'll buy us at least a couple of days. He was being ordered multiple times, move into Poland, attack Poland, protect them. And he refused. He played his other, you know, well, these couple of white soldiers might be running around and we're kind of worried about them. And to a large extent, hung um, that other Soviet army out to dry. Um, another fun little side note about what's going to happen in Again, I still haven't actually gotten to a fork yet, but uh, 
we're getting there. It's good. No, we're close. We're close. We're, we're very close. Uh, the northern troops were commanded by a man named Mikhail Tukhachevsky. Um, and their cavalry was commanded by Guy. Um, the southern troops were commanded by uh, Voroshilov and Budenoy. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm remembering and recounting those names is a couple of years later, whether you lived or died kind of depended upon which army you were assigned to. A lot of uh, Tukhachevsky is one of the most famous generals to have been killed by Stalin in the purge. And anybody who was with him in, in Ukraine in the South actually was safe. So, so it's a really weird thing to look at it and see, oh, wow. How, how that may have actually played a role in the life and death decisions of some of these people. Right. And of course, the, the, where the fork actually happens here now is assuming that, as I think you pointed out in the notes, you sent over to me, whether it's Stalin or whether it's maybe a different commander who actually takes those orders seriously. Um, if you crush this, uh, this you know, the, the miracle on the visual, this, 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 this very, very tacti tactically savvy sort of risky um, flanking maneuver that I guess probably militarily probably should not have succeeded right under under against a competent Soviet commander who would have followed the orders there maybe is a fair thing to say so um, if you change so if you change that what happens here is Poland as we know it and as it is able to survive and the the newly constituted Poland now is able to survive because of what happened in the real timeline if you change the outcome of this battle it's Poland we we hardly knew thee right. <laughs> Yes, I mean, to be to be perfectly honest, I feel like there was a Polish Republic in 1835. And I'm closing my eyes and trying to remember that it may have lasted just as long as this did. It's one of those it's it barely even counts as a as an independent state. It's it's it, it, it's it's a revolt that took a couple 18 months to put down. It, it, it hardly even registers as a, as a country. Yeah. Uh, uh, 1863, the, the yes. fact it's refer, referred to here in a lot of the, hist the historical art as, as an uprising. Yeah. <laughs> it's it just called an uprising. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, when you're called an uprising, that means you have a down thing coming for you pretty quickly. That's the very nature of most uprisings is they don't, they don't continue to move up. Yeah. And so again, now that we've, we've reached the fork, is, so what's different here is interwar the interwar european map and the balance of power that we know it from the, the our, our real timeline is not the same and one of the most notable differences is the the no no longer the existence of this thing we call poland right and, and so so that's what that's what we've changed here that's the fork is that by changing the outcome of this of this battle changing the the soviet army response to the uh to the um, to the the Polish offensive, is that we end up in a situation where Poland essentially dissolves into not being, and the Soviets are in a very different position in the new timeline map of Europe than they were in the old timeline map of Europe. Yes, and now I'm going to bring back those conceptions of what Europe is, because now they become important. The first conception of kind of globalization. And we're all going to be, you know, we're nations competing against each other, but we're all part of this one great European civilization. I'm kind of thinking about um, what we've discussed in earlier podcasts, how everybody in terms of leadership uh, at royal levels are each other's cousins. Right. And so we're cousins and we're still trading with each other and we can't go to war. Well, that has gone out the window. And that other conception of, this competition leading to a massive war that will destroy European society. Um, let's put a scorecard up. Massive war check, uh, hunger all over the continent, massive destruction, uh, socialist uprisings in the French military, general strikes in Great Britain, the Kaiser being overthrown by the Socialist Party in Germany, um, it looks like that other viewpoint might actually be right, might be coming true. And especially when you have these, you know, the Reds, the Bolsheviks on the foots, on the doorstep of Germany, 
who's the birthplace of Marx, has the world's largest socialist party, um, massive economy. This is kind of what the socialists and the Marxists predicted would happen. After this great world conflagration, the socialists would take power in Germany and would, you know, that would be the beginning of the end of the capitalist European order. So not only does not only is it important that Poland doesn't exist, it's also important now that Bolshevik Russia is right up against Germany and can start supporting communist elements in Germany. So that's why, you know, that's in the mindset of many of the people at the time, the our fork, the defeat of the Polish army might well have saved Europe from Soviet conquest. I don't agree. <laughs> um, I it, think it, it, it's, it's, it, it's a different kind of conquest. Right. I, it, and, and, and looking at German history at this point, if this happened earlier, if this literally happened one year earlier, in 1919, it might have. But by 1920 in Germany, you had had something called the Spartacist revolt. You had had multiple communist uprisings. You had had the Bavarian Socialist Republic. And every single one of those, all of those leaders, all of those organizers, all of those activists had been taken out and shot already by proto brown shirts at this point they were called the fry corps they were returning german veterans that picked up guns and protected kind of the old order so you know just timing wise there wasn't the german communist movement right next door to the soviet union that there would have been if it would have happened a year ago so i don't think there's this red wave that sweeps through Germany. And, and that's the key. The, you know, Germany at this point is the most industrial advanced country in maybe the world. It's very interesting to look at Nobel Prizes by country. They've been leading in physics and in medicine and in chemistry. And you know, Hitler changes that. After that, it, it, the United States starts catching back up, but Germany was the most advanced country in the world. And Marxist, communist, socialist theory said, once you take that, everything else just kind of, okay, yeah, they'll wrap up. Right. And so this is post Treaty of Versailles, uh, right. but the Treaty of Versailles is, I guess you can argue, it's become effective because it's, it's, it's agreed and negotiated in 1919 becomes effective in 1920 but it's a very fresh agreement and right. it was it was it was drafted and built upon an understanding of where things were you know immediately post conflict and what you were trying to accomplish through that so i guess my first question back to you chris the thing that's running through my head is i'm guessing we don't stick around with the treaty of versailles as we know it for very long right right um to kind of put an american spin on this I'm thinking a little of Andrew Jackson during the uh, Cherokee removal when he said that's uh, Mr. Tawney's order and he's welcome to enforce it. Um, the Treaty of Versailles had said there will be a Poland and these will be its borders. And the Soviet Union said that's very nice and try doing anything about it. Right. Uh, you don't really have troops here. You can, you know, if you did send troops there, which Britain and France did to try, you know, intervene in the Civil War. Uh, you have dock strikes in Britain and in France to try and stop supplies being sent to the troops fighting the Soviets. So, yeah, good luck. Good luck actually enforcing any of it on the other side of Germany. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the one thing that would have scared France more than Germany is a communist Germany. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, France during the Treaty of Versailles was 
a leading power in trying to punish them, trying to saddle them with both territorial concessions and economic concessions. And once they see that very much, you know, the, the way that um, France under de Gaulle was made to acquiesce to German rearmament in the 1950s was because we need them. Let's fight in Germany rather than fighting in Alsace. Right. And, and we talked about off podcast, one of the places I immediately went to as we were talking about this, this concept of you bring it forward. I said, well, so we just get to an earlier Cold War. And you said, no, Don, we don't get to an earlier Cold War because the Cold War is after, or the, the reason it becomes a Cold War is, we, is after we've had the second now major hot war in World War II. And we have the danger or the risk of nuclear weapons being brought into conflict, which of course means that the war needs to be cold because getting hot is not a place that you want to go. It gets really hot potentially right. Uh, right. if you go down that path. So what you're arguing is you may have a similar type of alignment, still a Soviet bloc, Western bloc type of alignment, but it's before the advent of nuclear weapons. So that is true. The other thing it's, you know, maybe a couple hundred miles further uh, because you now have East Germany and you now have probably the smaller states, uh, Czechoslovakia and Romania, also friendly to the Western Bloc. Um, you have Germany that, to a large extent, economically, if their finances could get straight, um could go right back to being a major center of power in Europe, unlike, um, unlike after the Second World War, German physical infrastructure after World War I was relatively intact. Right. They needed food and they needed finance. And enter the United States. Um, I feel like, again, you know, the United States was kind of a pox on everybody else's house. But if there's one thing that would have brought us back in, it was the threat of a communist Europe. And the United States had its red scare as this is going on. I, you know, this is these are all ripped from the headlines. These are all one thing happening after another, after another. And I think with. The loss of Poland, the United States, if it doesn't get involved, it helps finance, which it actually did in the 1920s. It helped finance German debt to stabilize that country. This probably just gets pushed up a little bit because the threat is more immediate. So you had the Dawes plan, which basically helped finance German reparations payments to Britain and France, which, by the way, they just turned around and handed back to the United States as, as repayment for their war loans. Um, so I think the United States steps in, helps um, financially stabilize Germany, starts shipping all of that wonderful, beautiful Iowa and Nebraska corn over there as much as they can to feed the people, to help stabilize it. Because again, that's what we did the second go round and helps rebuild a frontline German state to confront this Eastern Bloc. Um, so that's the first ripple of this. And you're right, there's another one, which is the Soviets are not going to just sit there. Um, inside the Soviet Union, there was a big debate about could you have socialism in one country? Could it exist without this wave sweeping the world, which is what they expected. Um, if they at least make it to the border of Germany, it's that's that is so close that they're not going to give that up. So they're going to start sending infiltrators, sending propaganda into Germany. They're not going to respect whatever government happens to form there. And in terms of the German government, I think you'll be able to have not not a Nazi government, a Western-oriented, authoritarian, but pro-Western government that the, the West could ally with. 
and maybe it takes until the 30s, but Germany's not going st- to sit there and take it. So you're going to see a hot war, except you haven't had the development of fascism. So now you've just got basically the NATO players taking on basically the Warsaw Pact. Oh, wait, I forgot one thing. You haven't had the five-year plan. You haven't had the industrialization of the 1930s. So you're dealing with a Russia that is now broken and peasant. You know, czarist Russia, after almost 10 years of war with itself, all of that devastation, all of that disruption. So I, I, I think you do have a hot war. And I think one of the other things you have is a arrangement where it's almost a national war. Um, you know, think about the effects. Think about how important just Poland was in ending our Cold War. I mean, you know, if you talk to a Pole today, they think that uh, John Paul II sprinkled some holy water on Gorbachev. That's how he got the birthmark, and he ran away screaming. That's what did the Cold War. Um, uh, and, but but, yeah. but I I can remember being uh, I can remember being still in school in my I guess middle school days. But you know mm-hmm. there's this there was this Polish labor guy uh, Lech. Yes. Yes. You know, Lech, uh, Lech Walenta. You know, and, and the uprising there. A lot of that was tied to. Uh, uh, to John Paul II being uh, of Polish descent, uh, having ascended to the papacy, you know, and 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 some of the, the freedoms that that Poles exerted through that, it, that that was a very interesting time because you're right that was that was among the first big cracks I can remember as a kid, in uh, in what was going to eventually lead to you know and historians have different interpretations about how this came to be in the 80s, but would eventually lead to the types of cracks that were big enough that 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 Soviet wall was going to fall at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it started with Poland, you know, it certainly then came over with, you know, the things that happened in the, in the latter part of the 80s as the Cold War there, you know, the falling of the Berlin Wall, all the stuff that, that goes on with that. But Poland played, as you, as you well point out, a major role in that. And I couldn't help but be struck when you mentioned Warsaw Pact. <laughs> Right. To realize the Warsaw that you referenced there is, you know, when, when I hear Warsaw, when you say Warsaw, I think Poland. And I'm sitting here thinking, what exactly would be that territory that Warsaw exists in in this in this alternate timeline? Would that be considered part of, you know, Russia, some so, Soviet satellite republic, you know, wh- wh- whatever it might a, look like. Here's a very interesting footnote. It would have been a socialist republic of Poland. Um If you look at the structure of the Soviet Union, they actually considered all of their constituent provinces or all of their constituent republics. Separate republics, yeah. Yeah. um, That's why it's called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. That's the the U in USSR. That's the U in USSR. To the extent that when in World War II we're negotiating the United Nations, Right. They actually, the Soviet Union got, went to Britain and said, okay, you are, you have the Commonwealth seat and Canada and Australia and New Zealand are all part of your Commonwealth. So you all together get one vote. And, you know, uh, to us, especially understanding, okay, yeah, Commonwealth, but by this point, those nations were very close to Britain, but they were not you know, they had their own governments. They 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 were nominally tied together. And one of the agreements to get the United Nations was Belarus and the, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic and the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic and the Russian Soviet Socialist Republic all got a seat on in the United Nations. Right. It's as if don't get a very big head about this, but Texas were to have a seat at the United Nations. Oh, and Oklahoma that's... were to. And yes. Oh, well, te- Texas could, Oklahoma couldn't, but we don't even need to go there for why that would need to be. 
but uh, yeah, but you're right. I, I I remember that very distinctly from uh, actually participating in uh, a program called Model United Nations when I was in high school, and so came to realize that oh, what you know at that time I didn't fully understand the history of it. So why do they get you know these the two mm -hmm. others that well the, the reason was as you point out to balance <laughs> what was viewed as being but again there's the Commonwealth and then there's yeah. all these other you know while they're not American territories there are other areas that. You know, around the world that are you know much closer aligned with the United States that need to have similar you know types of things accounted for. So if we get a hot war in let's say the I guess we're talking here in the late twenties, maybe the thirties, but when that happens, yes, yeah. what happens when that hot war breaks out? Um, we chase them back to where they are today. I I, I think again you know you have. One of the problems with what the United States wind up doing in the Cold War is so often we're against national forces. We're, we're, you know, during the 60s, the Soviets are out founding wars of national liberation in Cuba and in Africa and in Vietnam. And in this case, we have that on our side. We can go to, you know, Pilsudski, who in our timeline was defeated at this battle, has fled to Germany, is definitely still a presence. I mean, even, even into the 1920s and 30s, Kerensky, who was uh -huh. an anti-Bolshevik Russian, was still out there doing his thing. He was still present in emigre circles. So kind of like what you had in Britain during the Second World War is you have Queen Wilhelmina and King Hancock, I believe, of, of Norway, escape there and they kind of keep a nucle nucleus of the home country. You have these groups ready to step back into Poland and into what actually a wonderful example is Poland during the Second World War because they had, they were the first to fight and they had troops and political leadership that went to France and later Britain and were ready to go in after not after the Germans were defeated. And after that didn't work out, the United States kind of was also ready to use them and other similar groups to go into some of those Eastern European countries to start trying to foment trouble. And I think they're able to do that in this timeline because they're able to get access to those people and frankly once it becomes enough of a threat i think this western alliance can confront and can successfully take on the soviet union of the 1920s so obviously now we're talking about if we want to carry that you know far far forward on the fork yes. i mean we just we just we just eradicated most of 20th century most of the 20th century, at least the mindset of what most people would think of when they think of world, the world political struggle in the 20th century, you know, all, all politics is local and all struggles are, are much more contained than that. But you've just wiped out the entire, you know, Cold War as we knew it, um, World War II, and pretty much everything we know about the 20th century after this point. So to where were we... Extent. We where kind of hit we, the fast forward button. Yeah, where would we find ourselves today? Just really carrying it forward. We can go back and pick up stuff in between, Ooh. but where would we find ourselves today? You know, somewhere. Well, actually, almost exact. Well, exactly one hundred years removed. Yeah. Uh, from this, with without all of those things that were the big macro forces of the latter, let's call it latter two thirds of the twentieth century. I, I'm going to say I have absolutely no idea. That's the I, first I think, place I. That's the first place yeah. I go to. It's just such a radical turn. I can't even. I can think about possibilities. <laughs> I, I, the one thing I would say is, I mean, thinking about, and, and and I think this is a really interesting thought experiment to try and understand Russia today because they definitely view the Cold War as a loss for them. They definitely view independent Ukraine and Belarus as American satellites on their front doorstep. Um, I remember when I was in college, if you take the survey course in Russian history, 
it starts in Kiev. Russian history starts in Ukraine. So I'm imagining, you know, let's in our timeline, the only way I can kind of explain that to somebody else is imagine if you were in the southern United States, if you were in the Confederacy and your national history began with the Battle of Bunker Hill, which isn't in your country. You're always going to have some kind of affinity, some kind of, yeah, they're not ours now, but that's because of some things that happen. You're always still going to consider them part of your sphere, part of your special area. So whether it's, um, whether it's the Bolsheviks or Kievan, you know, what has happened to Russia since that happened to them in the 1980s and 90s, I think you could easily see, I hate to say this, honestly, but I, I said we short-circuited German fascism, but you may see it in Russia. You may see an ultra-nationalist right-wing totalitarian movement there instead of in Germany. Right. What, what do you think this would have been viewed as a repudiation of socialism slash communism inside of? Again, we struggle sometimes. I, you know, having grown up properly identifying the uh, the other superpower other than the United States, the Soviet Union, while still people were improperly calling it Russia, do they do they go back to being Russian uh, far more at some point? And is this is it a is it a repudiation? of this failed thing that led them to this point. Let's say there is a military defeat at the hands of the Western Alliance. I'll just call it that, not mm -hmm. to know what else to call it. If there's a defeat at the hands of the Western Alliance, is that viewed as being a repudiation of, um, of the communist thought or is that viewed as being even more of the seeds for why it needs to be re-sown and grown back? Um, I'm going to take this a very, very, very dark place. I hope you don't mind. That's fine. Um, First, geographically, whatever state is Russia is now ethnic Russians. I think when you have, when you cleave off Poland, one of Pilsudski's dreams was to create the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth of the 1500s. Basically, this Commonwealth, this collection of smaller um, ethnicities and principalities and peoples from the Baltic to the Black Sea. And I think he's, you know, they accomplished that. You, you cleave off the non-Russian parts of the Soviet Union, Russia. So you're back to what is just Russia. Um, and whenever you look at the histories of this war, the 1920 Russo-Soviet War, you always hear accounts of what happens when these armies are flowing back and forth through this area. Um, and there's a particular people caught in the middle of all of it. Uh, when the Russians come into an area, they go to the Jewish villages and say, those are the capitalists. Those are the Rothschilds people. Let's all take them out. And when the Poles come back into these areas, they look into the Jewish villages and say, those are Trotsky's people. Those are the commissars. So let's take them out. And I think given how many of the original Bolsheviks in the Russian Empire were of Jewish extraction, now I really think it, it's a possibility that, you know, the more I think about it, the more I can see a Russian ultra-nationalist proto-Hitler coming about in some way. And when, we, and when we use the term Holocaust now, we may be referring to the Russian Holocaust versus yes. what we think of as, you know, the events of in, in World War II. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, you know, I, one, one of the things that, that I'm, I'm keen to and uh, some we, we've covered this as a topic on the podcast as well, but also in other things that I deal with in my own personal life and opportunities that I have to teach in other settings 
is just really an understanding of, you know, and, you know, going gently here because it's tough to know and it, it, it's still a complicated thing to this day because of what goes on globally. But, uh, you know, the, the treatment of Jews in Europe historically mm -hmm. is, uh, is it's a complicated tale. Especially um, at the hands of Russians. Correct. I mean, it, it, yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a complicated tale. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's full of, you know, when we think of atrocities committed against people groups, and they happen today to groups certainly, you know, that are, that are non-Jews uh, globally. And they're, they're, we have, mm -hmm. genocide is, is not limited to any, you know, any one particular target. But when you look back historically in terms of how often uh, Jewish populations or those of Jewish extract were a target of various forms of, of genocide, discrimination on, on, on the very light end to full-scale genocide on the other end. But then the other great, you know, one of the other great flows of 20th century history is because of the events of World War II, the founding of the modern state of Israel, which then yeah. obviously has an effect on a whole other part of the world in the Middle East. And so, you know, it's one of these things you know, should should the change of a little bad, you know, if the miracle on the Vistula turns out differently, would we have, you know, one of the things you could possibly argue is would we have a modern state of Israel today? Would you have had, you mentioned the conflicts earlier, you mentioned 67, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, talking mm -hmm. in the Middle East, you know, would some of those things have come to be? I think you can make a very strong case of no, <laughs> or they would have come together in a very different way. You still might have seen the foundation of a modern Jewish state, mm -hmm. but only because of refugees and those that undergone genocide inside of a Russian version mm -hmm. of, of the Holocaust uh, versus what we know from World War II and the German version of that. Right, right. And, you know, again, th those are how, how do big sweeps of history get affected by small events? Well, they get affected because of just you know the, the domino effect, the butterfly effect, which is what so much of altered history is about. You know, that fork in time produces continuations as you go down that path that get bigger and bigger. And, you know, one of the things that occurs to me too, the other thing I was thinking about, you know, it's probably this is worthy of coming back in a, in a second episode at some point just to think through it in more detail. But so much of what we know as far as te technological advance in the 20th century was definitely fueled by the normal flow of the evolution of science and technology, which was already in place since the Industrial Revolution and before. But so much of, you know, so much of what we enjoy today, technology wise, for example, in the United States and in the West comes out of the space race. Yeah. And so if you don't have, if you don't have these two competing superpowers, they're competing over this concept of who's going to to dominate the next sphere, which is space, or who's going to send the first, you know, folks to the moon or whatever. Technology will evolve. <laughs> Technology is always going to evolve. That, that mm -hmm. we can see throughout the flow of history. But would it have evolved at different rates and focused in different areas, perhaps? So here's the one thing I'll say. Um, you say that we don't have the competition with the Soviet Union because it doesn't exist and that's absolutely true but you know what we do have a competition with Germany right like I mentioned they they shot themselves in the foot scientifically uh, 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 along with everything else horrible they did they shot themselves in the foot scientifically and a German technology advancing without that distortion we're they're putting up the first satellite without a doubt in my mind. And the space race is not between us and the Soviet Union. That's it's between us and our European allies. I mean, how often do you have, you know, it is exactly what happened in our timeline of, okay, we're fighting against the Germans. And as soon as one enemy is defeated, our allies now turn on us because they're the only ones left to have any competition with. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I, to, to me, that's just, you know, that's why I enjoy it. That's why this podcast got created. That's why I enjoy that thing. Says, you know, again, you change one small thing and you really start working out through and you start thinking fundamental things that I just accept as being, well, this this would have been the way that it is today or not necessarily so once you get far enough removed from the events. And, you know, again, we talked, we, as you said, we skipped way forward there, you know, we went, we went from the from the 1920s to the 2020s, you know, very quickly, but just thinking through what the long term implications of some of you know, a fork like this can be. And, you know, one of the questions that comes to mind is, does nuclear power probably get developed? I think the answer is yes, it was inevitable, because yeah. science was already headed down that path. Does it get its first use 
in a military situation or does it get its first use in some form of um you know use for power a piece a peaceful use uh you know that that seems like a small thing until you think that that's a huge thing because right. in some ways the way that we think about uh the very concept of nuclear energy <laughs> is always automatically tied back to the fact that it was essentially first used in war, Hiroshima well, and Nagasaki. The, the other thing is, I believe it would have been developed and it would have been used because, not to sound too much like Dr. Strangelove, but what's the point of developing the weapons if you don't use them? Part of the, part of what we talked about, part of why, you know, in every single episode that I, it feels like every episode I've done at some point you ask me, okay, does world war two still happen? Yes. World war two still happens. Okay. Does the cold war still happen? Yes. The cold war still happens and it happens cold because those were developed in the second world war. And they were used in the Second World War, right. and now we know what they do. And, and we've ne we've never, as a species, developed a weapon that ultimately we haven't used. Right, and and I, you know, I think I d expressed this at the end of some of our August episodes. Um, it uh, it's almost a good thing that it was used in a limited sense. Right. As opposed to us, and I'm going to say the Germans building up hundreds of these weapons, and all of a sudden we go to war, and now we have them, and we start using them in those quantities. Right. That, that yeah. yeah, yeah right, right. If, you, if you go from zero to 100 versus going from zero to one to two. Yeah. It's a very different, and and when both sides have the weapon, and that's you know, I know we talked about this in some of the episodes back in August when we were talking about alternatives to the to the end of the Second World War, uh, along those lines of you know, the the rationale behind Truman making the decision, you know, what what was the true rationale? How much of that was, you know, uh, stopping American and Allied casualties, avoiding the the need for a full scale invasion of the Japanese home islands? How much of that was to send a message to the Soviets? All of the above. <laughs> yeah, nobody uh, nobody handed him a uh, evaluation. Ask him to rank his his choices. Right. We don't but, know. But, but, but we also but we also know that you know part of it was once it was used, you know very quickly the thing was well we we <laughs> this can't happen on a regular basis even when the United yeah. States was the only nation that possessed which was a very short span of time I think it was forty nine uh, when the Soviets detonate their first weapon so it's only you know the the exclusivity of the club was very short lived. Yes. But um, but it was very, as you point out, because it was used in a limited fashion. And by the way, at scales, you know, that, that the Hiroshima weapon was powerful. The Nagasaki weapon was powerful. They ain't got nothing on modern nuclear weapons right. in terms of, uh, you know, we, we've never dropped a hydrogen bomb in conflict, for example, is. Uh, but when you see what the, the devastation is for that, or as I, I was actually reading this past week, some stuff about the Chernobyl accident, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, it's interesting to think through, you know, how much worse that could have been. Uh, I, by the way, I highly recommend HBO's uh, 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 miniseries on that, just to give some insight into that. There are some questions about some of the historical accuracy of it, a little bit of it ginned up for drama, but not a lot. But you certainly get the understanding about how dangerous a thing this can be. Mm -hmm. But then you also realize how powerful nuclear power can be in terms of you know eliminating need and want in some parts of the world as yeah. a, a relatively inexpensive source of power compared to fossil fuels and all the balance that we go through on all these things you know i think you well point out we've really gone far afield here but i think it's worth doing so the very fact that hiroshima and nagasaki happened has prevented those weapons from being used again and it eventually they would whoever developed them germany the united mm -hmm. states the united kingdom russia whoever would have developed them they would have been used yes and uh so then the question is are they used again in some limited fashion are they used or they are initially do they find their hands into some form of you know tyrannical madman <laughs> or mad woman who who's yeah. bent on doing something that that's a scary thought it is it is and, but but a real thought uh, nonetheless and uh you know, one of the things that I actually read something, I don't remember who the author was about five or six years, but the, the idea was imagine an attack that is like the Pearl Harbor attack, 
only that that sneak attack initiating you know let's get in the big punch before they can respond imagine that comes in the form of a nuclear attack versus yeah. versus a conventional attack if you have the yeah. capability of doing it and you've decided as you well pointed out earlier i've got to get my lick in before they do because the only way this works for me is a first round knockout uh, if this if this fight goes the distance i'm doomed well if you've got the weapon to really accomplish the first round knockout and you really believe that and you've decided that makes sense for the reason it makes sense what prevents you from using that weapon yeah yeah and and from the other perspective now that the other side, it's interesting. We think about now that the other side has that capacity, well, you're that much more likely to preempt their preemption. <laughs> so it makes things more dangerous, while at the same time, on some level, at least stopping kind of the Barbara Tuckman sleepwalking into war. Right, you're, right. you're 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 highly caffeinated you are on edge you are bloodshot eyes when you're making this decision but you at, on some level you understand its importance rather than just rubber stamping and oh that's the plan okay let's just go along with the plan yeah well, to, to you you mentioned tuckman there guns of august uh you know one of, one of my absolute favorite um uh, actually, television dramas of all time was done done on U.S. television as sort of a teleplay, which is the Missiles of October, mm -hmm. which takes off of the concept of the Guns of August, what leads up to World War One, and of course, the Missiles of October focuses on the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, the reason that has such drama and 13 days and all kinds of things have obviously been made around the Cuban Missile Crisis in terms of you know major motion pictures and and other types of things, the reason it has that is that it was not just about preventing war, it was preventing that kind of war, a nuclear war. Yeah. And, you know, th this idea of, well, you know, the, the equivalent of, <laughs> because you pointed out the equivalent of some Austrian archduke, <laughs> you know, getting assassinated, uh, takes on a whole other level of meaning if suddenly everybody has nukes and they're bringing them to the table. Sure, sure. And so somehow we managed to start in 1920s, Eastern Europe, and now we're talking about the specter of nuclear weapons. See, this is why I enjoy. <laughs> to be fair, as I history. remember my first episode, we were talking about the 1890 accidental death of a German Kaiser and spent an inordinate amount of time talking about the Russo Japanese War in 1905. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so it's on me. It's either yeah. it's your fault, Chris, or it's mine. We'll both we'll take responsibility. Uh, I, I, I was actually thinking about re, uh, renegotiating my title. Um, <laughs> I feel like foreign minister might be a good one because okay. when we talk, you know, if it, when you hear Alexis, we're staying on a certain island. When it's me, it's... I, you know, the last episode I did was uh, the Bull Moose Party, and uh, that was, I think, the first episode I've ever done that was just the United States. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll, yeah. we'll we'll talk about what we're talking okay. about whether we talk about whether we can reassign your portfolio. Okay. We'll talk about that. Yeah, cabinet reshuffle. Yeah, it, it, it seems to be perhaps the appropriate time of year, and I'm not going to chase that rabbit. You can't make right. me do it no matter what. Right. Uh, anything else that's uh, of, of pressing need about our particular topic since you and I went afield there for about the last 15 minutes or so? Not probably? really. I mean, it was a fun trip, and uh, we still never did catch that furry little woodland creature. Yeah, they, they, they tend to scurry across, across the path, and we never can quite get there. So, Chris, again, I enjoyed having you with, with us. I know you'll be back. In fact, you and I spent some time off podcast talking about a whole range of episodes that I think are going to be good stuff. Yeah. Uh, you, you were kind enough to mention that you had gone and completed uh, the, um, the big themes survey is how I described it in the last episode. And so, once again, I'm just going to mention, and if you want to echo or say anything about this, uh, certainly feel free to do so. Part of what we're looking to do there is just really just understand more about this concept of what are the big thematic points. We sort of hit upon that here. We, you know, we kept coming, we, we've come back to the same topics again, even though we launched off in, you know, 1920 in Eastern Europe, we ended up in the same place 
uh, that we launched off from talking about, uh, well, you know, Annie Oakley uh, missing yeah. her shot kind of thing. And yet we end up in the same thematic places. But we do encourage our listeners to go and take that survey. I'll put a link again here in the show notes for this show to go and do that. A couple of things there just to get some feedback generally on how our listeners view history and then also how to structure the podcast in such a way how we deal with that. Uh, I just have this suspicion that there's some of our listeners that go, no matter where you start, you end up at the same place kind of thing. And so the question is, do you believe that's just the function of what we're doing? Or is it somehow how we've organized ourselves that caused us to do there? So that's where we look for that feedback. But the other real big thing on that survey, and you mentioned this, Chris, I, I, I recognized your survey as we talked about off podcast <laughs> because of topics that we've talked about before. But it's a chance for our listeners to give back their feedback on what they believe those big themes are. But equally important, pointing out maybe some of the overlooked themes in history. And I know we were talking about some other episodes that we'll be doing here in the near term, which really go to places that I'll be the first to admit are not my areas of expertise when it comes to history, but even more so why I want to go there, because I want to understand more about what did happen or what could have happened in those particular theaters. In this case, we were talking about, you know, Southern Africa, in the, uh, you know, yeah. in the uh, in the 19th century as well, which I will be the first to tell you is, I, I think I told you off podcast, you can make up a fact there. And if it sounds plausible enough, there's a better than even chance I'll have to assume it's fact until I can go and research it for myself, because I only know the general sweeps of history there, not as many details as I do of other things. But that's exactly why I want to go there to learn the history a little bit better, which is sort of what this whole exercise is about. So I'm going to let Chris uh, just say anything that he wants to say before he closes out here, either in his foreign minister role or show instigator. He can decide which which hat he wants to wear. And then after that, we'll close things out. Anything you want to say before we close out, Chris? Uh, no, I just encourage people to send in ideas. Um, I think earlier there was the uh, episode I did with Brant, who hopefully will be, you know, resurfacing soon and we can do some more of those kind of group episodes. Um, that episode on Barbarossa Bard, uh, send in ideas, even if you don't feel like you, you know, can kind of riff on one for a, an hour, send it in. Um, and, you know, I'm making the offer and talking to Don about, you know, throw ideas our way and we can do some research and come up with our own kind of takes on them. If they're just an inflection point that you find interesting, but maybe just aren't quite at the point of doing the time and research to put one together yourself. Yeah. And, and beyond that, if you, if you do feel like uh, you, you have that, uh, uh, yeah, I, I've enjoyed one of the things I've greatly enjoyed. I've said this so many times is having Chris and Brant and, some of the other folks that have been on, on the podcast have been friends of mine, you know, running into, we had the episode here with, with Brody a couple of weeks back. Uh, <laughs> the chairs are always open. The virtual chairs are open. So uh, not only throwing in your topic, but if you want to come on the show and, you know, and present that topic and argue that topic or debate that topic or, you know, discuss that topic, please. <laughs> Uh, because we, I know that the shows that I enjoy doing the most and the shows that our listeners give us the best feedback on constantly are, are not what we call, what Alexis and I call the solo trip episodes, which we'll still do from time to time. There's no way to avoid doing that. But uh, if you, you have that thought and inflection, as, as, you, as, as Chris well pointed out, give us the thought. We're happy to jump on it, do our research and go through there. Or if you're, you're bold enough and want to, come on in. The water's warm. <laughs> We'd love to have you. And because uh, that's really what I've enjoyed. But this is not what I originally thought the podcast was going to be, to be perfectly honest. But it's the thing that I've enjoyed most about what it has become is an opportunity to bring in folks that are of like mind and sometimes unlike mind, uh, such as Chris and Brant, some of the others that I've mentioned there to bring them in and get some different thoughts here. So uh, that's good stuff. Oh, I know that you are probably uh, needing some rest after your long drive today, Chris. So I thank you for, for giving me some time as we had arranged this time to do this. And I'm looking forward to the next time that we're together. And uh, for the rest of the folks that are happy to just be sitting on our little fun conversation here, probably before I even looked at the clock, it's probably definitely been more than an hour's worth of recording. And we'll invite you back next time on A Fork in Time. Thanks.
Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more about the podcast at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Join us next time.